looking this morning at the tabernacle. And not so much, I'm not going to focus that much on the tabernacle. I want to look more on what the, the purpose of the tabernacle was and then how that translates, what it symbolizes for us today. And I can hardly believe that Dave talked about the temple this morning. I just like, I wasn't even listening really when he first got up and I heard him say temple and I perked right up. And um, that's right down the line that I was am going this morning. Um, he focused a little bit more on the temple being the church, and that is very true, but it's also personal. We are also personally temples of God because his spirit dwells within us. And the extent that we take care of our temple is going to also help take care of the temple, which is the church of God as well. So I want to look at the, uh, the tabernacle here. That starts in Exodus 25, basically 25 to chapter 30. I'm not going to read all of that or hardly any of it. But that is where God, so Moses, the children of Israel had come out of Egypt. They went through the Red Sea. And then they came to Mount Sinai. And God called Moses up to Mount Sinai. And the children of Israel could see the, the mountain of Mount Sinai. It had smoke on it and all that, lightning and thunder. That was God's presence up there. And then Moses walked up in there, and he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. And part of his time there, God gave him the pattern for the tabernacle. And in, during while he was up there, the children of Israel built a calf, and they worshipped the calf, which was what my last sermon was about, idolatry. And Moses came back down and then went back up again after he straightened things out and... After God gave him all the law and all that, they came back down and they built the tabernacle. So the tabernacle starts in chapter 25 of Exodus. I'm just going to read a few of the first um, verses here, starting in verse 20, chapter 25, starting in verse 1 of, of Exodus 25. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. And this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram's skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. The tabernacle was to be a sanctuary for God. God wanted to dwell with his people. In Exodus chapter 29, it says this, And I will dwell, this is God talking, I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will be their God, and they shall know that I am the Lord their God, that brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. In Leviticus 26, God is again confirming his covenant with the children of Israel. And he says this in verses 11 and 12. And I will set my tabernacle among you and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. Now this was all hinged on the Israelites keeping their end of the covenant, obeying God. This was their, they needed to keep their end of the bargain, if you want to call it that. But God wanted to dwell with his people. And what an amazing thing that is. That almighty God, the creator, wanted to, he, he wanted to get a people for himself. And he wanted to dwell among them. And so this tabernacle was to be a place for him to dwell. The word tabernacle, or actually, sorry, the word sanctuary, where it talks in uh, verse 8 here of chapter 25 in Exodus. He said, and let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. A sanctuary is basically a holy or sacred place. A holy or sacred place. We consider this part of the church usually the sanctuary, but what makes it holy is that God is here. And that's what the, the tabernacle itself was to be a holy place because a holy God was going to dwell there. Now, it's, I think we all know God is everywhere. He does not just dwell in one place. But he wanted a place where his presence and his glory would be. And that's why he put it there at the tabernacle. And it was important that Moses made it exactly like the pattern was showed. Or just like the pattern was. I used to build houses or help do framing. And we, we needed to follow the blueprint. You needed to put the windows at the right spot. 
You always needed to do that. And if not, the house wasn't going to come out the way it was intended, the way the architect or whoever was drawing up the plans drew it up. You needed to build it exactly accordingly. And that is how God wanted his sanctuary to be made. It was to be made exactly according to the plan that God gave Moses. And Moses did that. The structure, so the tabernacle had an outer courtyard. There was pillars, and I was thinking about putting some pictures up here, but um, there was pillars all, there was about, I forget how many pillars with hangings in between them, and that created a courtyard. And then within the courtyard was the actual tent of the tabernacle. And the tabernacle tent was divided into two sections. You had the holy place, and then you had the most holy place. And there was a curtain dividing those two sections, and in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, where that was basically where God's presence would dwell, was on that Ark of the Covenant, where the angel wings were tipped forward, and, and right there was kind of the mercy seat, or they call it the mercy seat. That's where God was said to have dwelled, right there. So, people could come into the courtyard, but only priests could go into the first holy place, and only the high priest could go into the most holy place. The closer you got to God, the holier you needed to be. And the closer you got to God, the, the more expensive and beautiful the instruments were, or the furnishings were. There were four pieces of furniture in the tabernacle. There was the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the most holy place. And then on the other side of the curtain, on the front of the curtain there, in the holy place, was the Ark of the Incense, then you had a table of showbread, and that was basically just a table, they call it the table of presence. And there were 12 loaves of bread on that table, and that was representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And then over here you had the, the lampstand. It, it was a, basically a big golden lampstand, and that, was, that would, was always to be lit. There was always to be bread on the table, and that was always to be lit. And then if you go outside the tabernacle... So if you're walking into the courtyard, first of all, you reach a, gold, a, a bronze altar. I was going to mention, all those instruments inside the tabernacle were all made out of gold. So they were expensive, beautiful items. They were all made out of gold. But outside the tabernacle, but within the courtyard, you had the altar, and that was made out of bronze. And that's where they did the sacrifices and all that. And then they had a laver or a thing to wash in. And that is where... The priests would wash before they went in to the tabernacle. It was important that you go in clean. The closer a person came to God's presence, the holier he needed to be. Only the priests could enter into the actual tabernacle tent. After the tabernacle was set up and consecrated, that was another part, God told Moses, after you set up this big tent and everything, then you need to consecrate it. And consecrating it means setting it apart. And that's basically kind of like anointing it, like you would anoint a king. But, and so they, would, they did this in various ways, but he was, part of it was, was um, sprinkling blood on the various items. And then also he needed to consecrate Aaron and his sons for priests, to be priests. And after all that was done, now this tabernacle was for God only. It was set apart for God only. And it was a holy place. And after all that happened, God's presence came down. And turn to Exodus chapter 40, and I just want to read about that part when God's presence came into the tabernacle. What a, it was a, I wish sometimes I could have been there to see it. I think it would have been amazing to see. Exodus chapter 40, starting in verse 34. So this was right after Moses had put up the tabernacle. Everything was done and in order. He had done it just as God had told him to. This is what happened. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. It's another word or another um, name for the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent, into the tent of the congregation because of the cloud abode thereon. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There was this cloud over the tabernacle. And that was God's presence. And when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. 
So whenever God's, if the cloud would move, they would quickly pack up the tabernacle and they would take it with them. As soon as the presence of God was, was up out of the tabernacle, they could enter in and take the furnishings and, and, and take them and, and, um, and carry them away. But then whenever the, whenever the cloud would stop, then they would stop, they would set up the tabernacle, and God's presence would come back down. Can you imagine living like that? Having Actually, in Deuteronomy, um, Moses is telling the children of Israel, in chapter 4, he says, What nation is there that has a God that dwells among them? And what nation is there that took a people to be his own? I think Christianity is the only religion, or I, as far as I know, that has a living God that dwells inside its, its people, dwells inside his people. When I was over in Asia, there's temples all over in Asia, most of the Buddhist temples, especially in Thailand, China, Laos, and... It, the, the whole thing of bowing to images just became real to me as I watched as people would bow down to these images. But they're dead. They are dead. Christianity is alive because our God is alive. So here, they could see, they could always, if you ever, was wonder, if you ever wondered if God was here, you would look towards the tabernacle and there was the cloud dwelling over the tabernacle. Or at night, there was a pillar of fire but there was also, I don't know if you want to call it a downside really, it's not really a downside, but there was something else. If you were God's chosen people and he was living among you, you had to be a holy people because God can only dwell among holy people. And that's why they would constantly be doing sacrifices so that they could be presentable before God. After the nation of Israel settled in the land of Canaan, um, King Solomon built a temple instead of the tabernacle. And so if you hear me say tabernacle or temple during the sermon, I'm meaning the same thing, kind of, because I'm meaning a place where God dwells. Um, sometimes I forget myself and I talk about tabernacle and I mean temple. Uh, or, but it's both, they, were, they were both meant to be the same thing. They were both there for the same thing. So King Solomon built a temple in place of the tabernacle. The tabernacle and temple were to be holy and sacred. They were to be holy and sacred because there was a sacred and holy God living inside the tabernacle. In Exodus 29, starting in verse 42, it says this. So let me just give you a context here. They were to, be, they were to, to have sacrifices going all the time. There was a supposed to be, a, or not all the time, but there was supposed to be a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice every day. And that was just as a pleasing aroma, it said, to God. Just a way of worshiping God. And so God had given this to Moses, and then he said this. This shall be a continual burnt offering throughout your generations at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, where I will meet you to speak there unto, you, unto thee. And there I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle shall be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to be minister to minister to me in the priest's office. God's glory would sanctify the tabernacle. No unclean person or thing was allowed into the tabernacle. It was never, it was never to be marred. It was always to be clean. Because God dwelled there. He deserved a clean and holy place to dwell. The tabernacle was a holy place. The rituals of worship, the, the um, offerings that they would offer, the sacrifices, and all the various rituals that they would go, the priests would go through, it was important that they always did it just right. If they didn't, they would either die or they would be cut off from the land of Israel, from the nation of Israel. It was important that they did it just right. Again, follow the pattern. Follow the pattern exactly that God had given them. And again, this was because they were dealing with a holy God. An almighty God. And so things needed to be done just right. They always washed before they walked in. If they had touched anything unclean that was considered unclean back in their day, they were to become clean again. And there was a whole set of a process to go through to become clean. They would need to become clean before they could go in. And then you, of course, had the most holy place, and the high priest would enter that only once a year. 
on the Day of Atonement. And there again, it was so important that he did everything just right, or he would die, because he was right in front of the presence of God. So it was important that it was set apart. It was a, a sanctuary for God, but it was holy and set apart. The tabernacle, I, I already kind of went over this a little bit, but it was, it was to be consecrated, which is another term for set apart, it, because it was a sanctuary for God. There was to be no other images in the temple. My last sermon was about idolatry. There was to be no other idol worship in the no idol worship in the temple. Only the worship of God. There wasn't to be graven images of uh, articles of worship in the temple. God's presence dwelt there, and so this tabernacle was only for him. Only for him. It was to be a sanctuary for God to dwell in. But the temple did become desecrated. It became polluted. And this was after Solomon had built the temple. And through the years, the land of Israel, with, they had various kings, and they, they slipped further and further into wickedness and into especially idol worship. And the temple became a place of, of worshiping other gods. It became a place of pollution. It was marred. It was not for God only anymore. Other gods were being worshipped there. King Ahaz, which was the father of Hezekiah, which was one of the good kings, but his, Ahaz wasn't, but Hezekiah was a good king. His father Ahaz basically took some of the articles out of the temple and shut the doors. Didn't even worship in there anymore. He closed the doors of the temple. The temple was desecrated by the worship of other gods. We read about this in Ezekiel chapter 8. I, I find Ezekiel 8 and chapter 10 kind of fascinating. But it talks about the, what Ezekiel saw. So Ezekiel, let me just kind of tell you the rest of the story here. So because of their wickedness, the children of Israel were exiled. They were punished for their wickedness and they were sent into exile. And while in exile, Ezekiel was a good prophet, he was the prophet of the Lord, but he went along into the exile. But while he was there, God showed him a vision of the temple in Jerusalem. And I don't know when this happened so far as when God's presence left the temple, but there was a time when God's presence left the temple because that he could no longer be there anymore. It was too filthy. It was not holy anymore. And in chapter 8 of Ezekiel, God shows him various abominations or things that were happening in his temple, his sanctuary. He was showing him various forms of worship of other gods and things like that. And it was awful. And God would say, do you see this, what they're doing? And he would be like, and, and Ezekiel would see it, and God would say, I'm going to show you even worse what they're doing. And he showed him basically four different things that were happening there, four or five. But I'm just going to read one verse here. In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 6, he says, Ezekiel is, is saying, he said to me, further, he said furthermore unto me, son of man, seest thou what they do? This is God speaking. Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. So he was showing Ezekiel the abominations that were happening. And basically, the temple was becoming desecrated. There was an image of jealousy. And I don't know what that was, but I imagine it was some kind of an idol that was provoking jealousy in God. Because this was, worship was to be for him only. There was images on the walls of the temple, images of other gods. There was offering of incense to other gods. One of the pictures, one in the vision, he saw women weeping for another god. And then he saw men worshiping the sun. And some of those, all of these were specifically mentioned in the, old, in, in the book of Exodus and Leviticus, that they are never to do these kinds of things. And here they were happening in God's temple in God's sanctuary, the place where he was dwelling, these things were happening. It became a completely unholy place, and it was not set apart for God anymore. And I believe God was very long-suffering with the children of Israel, but there came a point in time when he said, I can't be here any longer. This place is not for me. This place is, is not set apart for me anymore. And, and in Ezekiel chapter 10... Ezekiel describes his vision of 
the glory of God leaving the temple. And I don't know when that happened in the nation of Israel's history. But that, would be, that was a sad day when the, when the glory of God left the temple. In Ezekiel chapter 10, 18 through 19, it says, Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim, and the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. When they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And this is just describing the vision of, or the, the presence of God. And everyone stood at the door of the... The wheels were also were beside them, and every one stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the Lord of Israel was over them. So basically, Ezekiel saw the presence of God lift up, and eventually he saw it move away. And I, I wonder if this happened in stages, kind of. You know, I, don't think, I don't know that God's glory left all in one day, but it was probably a progression. But there came a time when God said, I cannot be here anymore. This is not my temple anymore. This is not a sanctuary for me any longer. The temple became a place marred by idolatry. And if you remember from my last sermon, I said, idolatry is the worship of something or someone other than God as if it was God. It is putting something else in the space that only God should occupy. So this was happening in God's space. In his sanctuary was idolatry, the worship of other gods. And God could no longer dwell in a place that was not set apart only for him. So where is God's dwelling place today? Dave talked about that a little bit in devotions this morning. It is the church. The church of God is, is a temple of Christ. Or the, temple, the, the church of Christ is the temple of God. But the reason that is is also because we are the temple of God. I didn't write this down, but in, I think it's Revelation chapter 21, there is a big announcement in heaven that says, the tabernacle of God is with men. And I believe that is talking about when we get to heaven, we are going to dwell in the physical presence of God. But it's also, I believe, talking about today. The tabernacle, the dwelling, the tenting. The tabernacle was a tent. The tent of God is with men. He is inside of us. His spirit is in us. God's presence is within us. We are the temple of God. He wants to dwell with men. Just like I believe that whole tabernacle in the Old Testament is a symbol and a picture of what he is doing in our lives today. That he is dwelling inside of us today. And in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says this, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word is Jesus Christ. It was made flesh. Jesus is God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word dwelt, uh, um, and the word of, was made flesh and dwelt among us, that has to do with tenting. That's the same kind of word that is used when it's talking about the tabernacle. Or, well, it's a little bit different, but it has the connotation of a tent, like the tabernacle was a tent. Or in camping. So, Jesus, when he came, he tented among us. He tabernacled among us. But then Jesus, after he died and rose again, he left. He ascended to God. And now that he is, and then after he ascended to God, the Holy Spirit came. And now the Holy Spirit is living in our hearts. So we are the temple of God. And because we are the temple of God, the church is also the temple of God. God dwells in the hearts of those who love him. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Six fourteen to eighteen. Second Corinthians six verse fourteen. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 
We are now the temple of God. What kind of a temple is he dwelling in, in your heart? God dwells in the hearts of those who love and obey him. In John 14, verse 22 to 23, it says this, Judas, this is not Iscariot, saith unto him, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest or make thyself known unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And that abode, again, means a dwelling place. He will live within you if you love and obey him. God living within us. What does it mean to you to think about that God lives within you through his spirit? His presence is within you. Sometimes I, I feel like the, the Jews or the, the Hebrew people have a little bit of a, a better understanding of this because they saw God in his glory in Mount Sinai. They saw the big cloud over the tabernacle. And I believe they had a fear of God that sometimes we don't have. Now, we are living in a time of grace more than they did back then. Because of Christ's sacrifice, we don't have to follow all those rituals that they followed. But we still, I think sometimes we lose the holiness of God. And we don't realize exactly what it means to actually have God dwelling within us. Almighty God, your creator is dwelling in you if you have God, Christ in your heart. What does that mean to you? And is, it, is he dwelling in a holy sanctuary in your heart? Or is it a place that's being, where he's being crowded out with other things? I think it's amazing that God would choose to live inside sinful people. Now, with Christ in us, we have a righteousness that makes it possible for God to dwell within us. But still, we are a fallen bunch. And yet, God wants to dwell within you. He wants to dwell within me. Isn't that amazing? And what kind of a sanctuary does he have? Does he have a place that is set apart? It's just for him? Or are there some other things crowding him out? Something that just really came to me as I was studying for this is that the tabernacle and the temple back in the Old Testament were to be holy, consecrated place for God to dwell. He did not lose any holiness, or he is not lessening his holiness by dwelling in us. That means the temple that he dwells in today should be every bit as holy as it was back then. Our lives are to be holy lives. We are to be set apart, consecrated for God. Now I want to be clear that this can only be done through Christ. Christ makes us clean. It is only through Christ's work that you and I can have God dwelling within us. But we have to take care of our temple. And that is a choice that we make. What we do with the temple that God is living in. Do not try to make yourself holy enough so God can dwell within you. That is not the purpose Jesus Christ has taken care of that if you have accepted him into your heart. But there are many times that we allow things into the temple that are crowding God's God out to where sometime he may say, I cannot dwell here anymore. This is not for me anymore. And I hope that never happens. But it can if we are not conscious of what we are allowing into the temple, into our lives, into our heart. When I say temple, I'm talking about our lives. Just to kind of give a few scriptures here, I'm going to read again what David read, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 to 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Again, this is speaking of the church, but I believe it's also speaking of our personal lives as temples. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. What do we do with the temple, with the temple of, of God? What kind of a temple is he dwelling in? You know, when company comes to our place to spend the night, we usually clean up the room if it's dirty, make the bed, make sure the bed is made. We want it to be welcoming, we want it to look nice when company comes. Is that how God is finding your life? Is it a welcoming place for him? Is it a place just for him?
I think it's important for us to think about what we are allowing into our lives. The influences that influence us day, and day, day in and day out. And I said before that I believe idolatry is kind of the, the sin before the rest of the sins. Because has, idolatry has all to do with yourself. And when you start focusing on yourself and you start worshipping the idols of pleasure and the idols of money or success or whatever, and when you allow ungodly influences in, you are starting to follow idolatry. If a young man starts with pornography, he is following the God of pleasure or instant gratification. If you are following the God of money or, or think, you know, the only influence you have in your life is all about just being able to do, you know, make money. That's all I care about in life. You are following the God of success and of reputation and of trying to get your, make your name in the world or, or trying to make sure you are set for the rest of your life. There's just all kinds of influences. I think sometimes I can't believe I preach this way anymore because I used to scoff at those that did this. But I, I think the music you listen to is a huge factor in the influence of your life. And it can take you towards God or it can take you towards other gods. I don't think listening to a certain thing is exactly wrong in itself, but it, it takes you in, it can take you in a wrong direction. Same thing with the books you read and and things like that. It's important that you are thinking and dwelling on things that are good because they influence you and they will take your mind and eventually they will take your overtake your temple as well that God is dwelling in if you're not careful. We need to worship God in his temple. The Christian life is more about relationship than it is about just a religion. And so it, you need to take time to focus on the relationship and to worship God in his temple. Worship God in your heart. Spending time with God will help us keep the temple in good shape and consecrated. Again, consecrated is set apart only for him. Loving obedience is what God is looking for in his temple. He, wants, he will come and abide in you if you are lovingly obeying him. And I think even just being aware that God is living here, if you are aware of that, the more you become aware of that, the less casual you will be about your life. If you are aware that God is living inside of me, I don't think you should be going through your life just scared of everything you do. But if you think about it, God is in here. What would, what's this going to do? What, no matter what I'm doing, what, how is that going to affect his dwelling place in here? Don't let idolatry mar God's temple. I believe every person on earth is a potential temple for God to dwell in. But there are many of them that are too marred by idolatry that he cannot dwell in them. Until they ask Christ in and, and through the righteousness of God, or through the righteousness of Christ, God can dwell in them. Every person God created, he made for himself. He wants to dwell in them. But sadly, many of them are too filthy for him to dwell in. And if we let idolatry take root in our heart, and it begins to crowd God out, I don't know when this happens, but there will be a time when God will say, I cannot dwell here any longer. This place is not for me. It is not set apart for me. I'm not comfortable here. Or I'm not welcome here. Maybe just to kind of sum up what I'm trying to say. When I went to Asia years ago, we traveled to the country of Laos, which is, I think it borders Thailand and Vietnam and some of them. It's a communist country. We were there for only a few days. But while we were there, some of us guys rented motorbikes, and we just went motorbiking back in. All, all around the city, and then we went back in the country. So we were going for quite a while, and we got hungry. And we were back in this just rural area, and we were like, where are we going to eat? How do we find a place to eat? So we somehow asked someone, "How you know, is there any restaurant around here? And they saw we were foreigners, of course, and, and said, yeah, yeah, down. They told us where, kind of, as best they could, and so we followed directions, and we came to this long drive with a little guard at the front. We're like, whoa, what place is this? 
And so the guard could speak a little bit of English, and we asked him if there's a restaurant back there. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went back this long drive, came to a, came in sight of a building setting up on a hill, and then, of course, the road going up to the building, and right at the base of the build of the hill was a little restaurant that was open air, very, you know, just basic. And we were like, I was like, let's eat there. Now, you, you must know, and you might know this already, I hate getting embarrassed. I hate, especially when I, um, well, that's when I'm embarrassed, when I unintentionally do something that people laugh at. So, I, I, I felt already, being in Asia, I felt a little bit like a fish out of water. Because I just, I, I don't like new things like that because it makes me feel so uncomfortable because I want to fit in. So, I was like, this restaurant looks just good, let's just go here. And some of the guys were like, but I think there's one in that building. Let's go check out that building and see what it's like. So we, <laughs> we get up there. We was probably five or six of us on our motorbikes. We're dusty. We're sweaty and dirty. We walk up to the building, and this lady comes out to meet us and is just dressed to a T. We're like, okay. She goes, and she could talk English. And she said, come on in, come on in. We, got, we were like, is there a restaurant in here? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she took us in, and she took us up to the receptionist's desk, as we're walking up, one of the receptionists just bust out laughing. Just looked at us, and she was like, just started laughing. I was like, oh boy. Anyway, we start looking around. The building is just immaculate. It's very nice. We go to the bathroom to clean up a little bit, and we weren't the only foreigners there. We got the picture that there are other, I don't know, we might have been the only Americans or white people, but still, it's not like they weren't used to seeing other people at this place. But people just stared. And so finally we got, came back out and the lady took us back to the restaurant. We had to walk through several rooms to go to the restaurant. Came to realize it was, I believe, a casino. And I didn't gamble. But had to walk through the casino to go over to the restaurant. And so we tried to order our food and all that. And they knew some English because, of course, people would come that knew some English. But the whole time we were there, people would just stare at us. Sometimes they'd come and, like, out. They would come into the restaurant part just to like sit and stare at us, and it wasn't like they were nice about it either. And finally, I was just like, let's get out of here. <laughs> and finally, we decided to leave. We got out, or we, we uh, walked through the, re or through the whole building again and came out to our motorbikes. And I'll just never forget this. We get onto our, our motorbikes, and we all look up, and there are people hanging out of the windows watching us leave. And there are people coming out the front door watching us leave. And it's not, again, it's not like they're nice about it. They're, they're just hanging out, like, looking and watching. And you could just tell we were not to be here. We, we, this was not for us or something. Or something was weird about us. And so we finally just left. And, and I just will never forget that feeling of feeling like a fish out of water. I wanted to be out of there so bad. And yet I wonder if God feels the same way sometimes in my heart. Or in your heart? Does he ever feel like a fish out of water because he does not belong? Because too many things are, are, are in that same space that is not godly, that is not for him. I don't know. I just will never forget that. Never ever. That was quite an experience. But don't let idolatry mar your temple. Just a little bit yet on rebuilding the temple. Dathan read Haggai chapter 1. And Haggai was a prophet again, of the children of, of, it was a prophet there. But the setting of Haggai is that, so as I had mentioned earlier, the children of Israel had been exiled. And after they had been in exile for quite some years, they came back to their homeland. They came back to Jerusalem, to the temple. And the temple was in ruins. But one of the first things they did was they started building the temple. And we read about that in, in Ezra. But then they faced some opposition. And... So they just quit building the temple. And so it was, it was I, I'm not sure how far along it had been, but they stopped building the temple. And so they started building their own houses. They started working their own land. They just left the temple go. And that is what's setting here of Haggai chapter 1, where Haggai, through God, God is speaking through Haggai, saying, why are you dwelling, why are you living in your houses when my house is still in ruins? Go ahead and build it. I want to come back and dwell here with you. But you need to build the house. You need to build the temple before I can come dwell with you again. 
They were fo- focusing more on their own property, their own houses, their own lives. They were not focusing on the fact that God's presence was not really there yet. But it would be if they built the temple. And Haggai here encourages them to build the temple. He encourages them to, to keep working on the temple rather than building their own lives. The temple was, was still in ruins. A crumbling temple signifies a crumbling relationship. If your temple, or if your, your temple where God is dwelling is crumbling, your relationship with God is probably crumbling as well. Same thing for a church. If a church, the temple of God, is crumbling, then the relationship with God is probably crumbling as well. God is a mercy of redemp- is a God of mercy, and He is a God of redemption. If you find your temple is in ruins, God wants you to rebuild. And if you t- if your temple, I think it's it's good for us to take stock of our lives and think about, you know, what is in my temple? Does it need a cleaning out? Are there things that are crowding God out? God is long-suffering with us. But he wants a place that is only for him. He wants a a place that is set apart. It's a sanctuary for him to dwell in. What I want you to remember today is that the place God dwells today should be no less holy than the place he dwelled in back in the Old Testament. He wants a sanctuary, and we are that sanctuary We also have a part to play in building our temple and keeping it and, and, and keeping it free from idolatry, free from sin, free from dirt that's getting in. And may God never say, I cannot dwell here any longer. Make sure you take care of your temple. Let's kneel for prayer.